it could could be seen as sort of speaking in terms of friendships, but what about like romantic relationships or any other class of partner partner relationship? Yeah. So one thing that I come across with a lot is kind of generally speaking, again, our inability to decode flirting. Uh, mm. I was I was running a class on this other day on dating and relationships, and somebody was saying that they had gone out for drinks with somebody, come back, and their friends were like, "How was the date?" And she was like, "That wasn't a date." And they're like, "That was the date." So just knowing, like, she had been invited on a date, went on a date, didn't know that it was a date, and came home, and like all of her friends were like, "You went on a date." So. I think there's a lot of the decoding where unless it's like very specific, like I want to date you, I want to hold your hand, you know? So I definitely think it can be hard to receive flirting and understand it also to give, you know, to be flirtatious. Cause that, to me, that almost feels like a mask, you know, again, I just like to be kind of straightforward about what I'm thinking and feeling. It's it's kind of, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Cause as mu- as much as we would like to avoid it, there is, you know, there is some kind of playing aspect of the whole. You know, are we gonna are we gonna go on a date? Whatever, are we attracted to each other? And it's kind of that 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 whole, especially at the start, that kind of strange dynamic where you both mm-hmm. know that you, yeah, you, you both understand what you each other is trying to do, and you, you're trying to work with that, especially with the flirting. Like I've had, I've had people flirt with me before and I know it's, it's, it's hard to believe, but. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I, I pretty much always take it as a negative. Like if people are like poking me and like uh, picking at me, I'm like, I don't like that person. It's like I'm pushing to the side and, you know, you have that whole rhetoric of, <laughs> oh, if you're, you're younger and you're at school and a girl's like hating you and like picking at you. It means that they like them. It's kind of like that, but I just take it straight as a negative. And I just, like, hmm. that's interesting. <laughs> like the, the whole sort of flirting dynamic. It's very, very like, I don't like him really that much. Yeah. It's I confusing. And I know that it's something that's needed, like sometimes, especially if you're wanting to date a, a neurotypical individual. It, it, it can be quite hard, definitely. Like, yeah, because it's de- yeah, it's definitely an important part of a of a relationship in the sense that you're you know flirting is a way to express interest in each other, hmm. and you know I think along with that comes physical touch, which can be very challenging. You know, a lot of people on the spectrum are, our need for physical touch is going to be very different. So some people um, might need a whole lot of it and might need like really, you know, a firm kind of physical mm. pressure. And then some of us don't want to be touched at all. Mm, it's and, kind of sensory and then, defensive kind of. Yeah. And then that might, that might change every day. So like maybe today you need lots of attention and affection and the next day you don't want any. Sure. So that can be very hard to navigate in a relationship because it, you know, most of the time, again, generally speaking for the autistic population, like it's not personal, you know, it's not because I don't like you and you're making me mad. It's like, I just need some space. Just don't want to touch anyone. I don't want anybody to touch me. And especially as a mom, when you have your kids climbing on you all day, every day. (laughs) The Aspie world is talking about that as well. I was listening to that one the other day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I obviously, I, I, I was thinking it would be great to talk to you about about parenting and stuff. Just you know, yeah, part in you know how you present yourself online. I think, I think it's really interesting. I, 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 I forgot something and then I've remembered it about sort of that whole flirting dynamic thing, mm-hmm. and it's it's very indirect. It's all in it's indirect communication, like mm-hmm. direct communication most of the time for me has not worked, like going up and saying, "Hey, I like you, uh do you want to go on a date? you know like <laughs> <laughs> like uh do you want to do this like actually having the you know doing the questions kind of 
detracts from the whole process that a lot of people go through when they find someone new. Um, and so they, they kind of think it's a bit weird. It's kind of a mm-hmm. bit desperate, even even though they may be feeling like that's something that they might, you're something that they might want to pursue. Yeah. It's, it still comes back to the fact that, you know, you're being direct with them and that's kind of rushing things along in their brain. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very confusing. No, it does. Like like you said, you you can be direct about something and then the other person might want that too, but it's like the fact that you were direct about it kind of throws everything off, Mm. which is... But I like what you said about flirting being indirect communication and and that makes a lot of sense why autistic people would struggle with that because we do prefer direct communication and we have a hard time reading between the lines. So that that makes a lot of sense. I've done a lot of work on improving cognitive empathy which is do you are you you aware of the adaptive cognitive empathy stuff a bit i've i've done a little bit of research on it not enough to like explain it to you (laughs) so adaptive empathy is showing the it's pretty much what we think of empathy being it's showing the correct response to someone's emotional state and there's another half to that there's the cognitive empathy part of it which is being able to notice based on indirect signals like mm. bodily cues, how they're speaking, whether they're acting differently than usual. And if I think that that's, you know, over time I've, I've really been sort of trying to build up my cognitive empathy. So I can tell nowadays if people are, are, are like interested in me, I got to whether they want to be friends or whether they want a relationship. But I know that they want to, interact with me um but the actual like especially if i was thinking myself as a as a single man going out in the world i i I, and i didn't have access to any online apps or anything like that i would Mm -hmm. just walk around thinking nobody likes me like because i just literally i just don't pick up on any of those like signals those signs um so I, i almost in the past you know, primarily use dating apps, which, you know, we, that could be a whole conversation that we could have about, <laughs> yeah. about that stuff. But <clears throat> yeah, that, that, those early stages, those are, those were really hard, but, and, and can be quite difficult to ma- navigate, um, especially if you don't have a lot of um, experience, like if you mm-hmm. haven't dated anyone before, if you haven't, um, if you don't have many, a lot of practice with social interaction with neurotypical people. I'm talking all, of course, in the context of autistic neurotypical, but yeah, now that can be a barrier, but what about, you know, during, you know, once the relationship has been somewhat characterized as you guys being together, what kind of issues do you think sort of come up as far as like maintaining that relationship? Um, Well, I think it's a lot of the same, actually. I mean, I think it's just continuous communication challenges. I mean, and that's any relationship, like it's important to evolve your communication skills. Um, But particularly, you know, one thing that I do talk about a lot is whenever you're in a neurodiverse relationship, we'll we'll say one is neurodivergent, the other is not. It can be really helpful. Let's just say autistic if an autistic person can can uh, become more aware, and this is something we work on kind of in some workshops, become more aware of what your signs are when you are having a meltdown. Um, and that takes practice, that takes time. And then when you're not in meltdown mode, at a, in a safe space and a safe time, being able to communicate what that looks like to your partner. Mm-hmm. So they know like that's a, a really major thing in neurodiverse relationships is autistic people feeling bad that they can't communicate what's happening when they're in meltdown or shutdown. So if you can learn to communicate about those things before or after they happen to kind of give your partner the understanding of, okay, this is what's happening. It's nothing personal. The things I can do to help are give space, bring them a snack, like take the kids for a while. Um, So I think you know, for a lot of autistic people, it's learning how to communicate about these things when you're not in a state of shutdown. And that has been really instrumental for a lot of, a lot of relationships that I've 
worked with recently? Yeah, I think it's 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 always a, a difficult one because you know there's that whole concept of double empathy. You know, we can find it a little bit harder to understand and empathize with the neurotypical experience, and 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 likewise. And so there's always some level of understanding or awareness gap like mm-hmm. uh, around communication especially when there's emotions involved like in an argument or something mm-hmm. um you know where, where all logic goes out the way and we're in some some emotional state i think uh it's definitely like it's definitely a hard thing to do because it requires you to really really understand yourself Yes. Uh, but also understand yourself in relation to the neurotypical brain. Right. What's different about them? How am mm-hmm. I different from them in these areas? And then you've yeah. got to try and find ways to explain it so that they understand. And right. they have to do the same. So like <laughs> the opposite way around. Yes. It's very convoluted. Yeah. And it, like you said, it involves a lot of self-awareness and this to me is like a, a lifelong process because our, our meltdowns and shutdowns are going to evolve and change over time. And so just continually checking in with yourself and having that self-awareness of what is going on. And like you said, how do I communicate this and how is it different than what my partner is experiencing? It's a lot. Mm-hmm. It's very challenging. I find that for anybody who is may- maybe struggling and kind of sort of bridging that gap, I found writing really helpful, like having my own space to speak because mm-hmm socializing inherently has some kind of like driving force behind it like some kind of right we need to continue the conversation on so sometimes it's really hard to to speak in a detailed understandable way like on the spot like Mm -hmm. especially if it's not something that we've we've been thinking about for a lot long time and we don't have those views sort of um inherent to us and I, re- I really like your, your suggestion about communication because it is ultra important in every relationship to communicate. Mm-hmm. Not many people get it right. <laughs> A yeah. lot of people do. And then, and then adding the aspect of having two different brains together, it's like, whew, Jesus, you need to like properly understand the communication. Mm-hmm. You know, if someone feels that something's a bit off, that you have a conversation about that and you try and get to the bottom of it. It's not a fun process. It's not like a romantic kind of right. ideal kind of in, in the moment. In the moment, it's not romantic. But but yeah, I think then afterwards you feel the safety yeah. between the two of you, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's definitely worth that investment of time. Something interesting that might be helpful. So in the community group I was running recently on dating and relationships, there was a suggestion from one of the community members that I thought was just fantastic. So in relation to physical intimacy, um, we were talking about how difficult it can be to transition into that space. And so they yeah. use, a, they have a light, uh, like a special light and either, either partner can turn it on whenever physical touch is okay, whenever that's something that they want. Um, and nobody has to respond like it's, it's, you know, take it or leave it kind of thing. So nobody has to talk about the fact that the light is on. Nobody has to respond if they don't want to, mm-hmm. but it's, it's one way they're able to communicate. Like I am open to receiving physical touch and it kind of cuts down on the need for communication and the, and it helps transition and like from one mental state into another one, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like the, um, like the red light, amber, green light kind of system that you have for like autistic people in school, autistic people at events. They have like the system where it's like green, come up and talk to me, you know, mm-hmm. amber. It's like, I prefer to, to not talk, um, but if it's important, come talk to me. And then red's mm-hmm. like, no, like, get, get away. I don't want to talk. I suppose you could do it. It doesn't necessarily have to be a light, does it? It could be like a reversible wristband or like a one of those. Yeah, it could be anything. Those, those octopus plushies where you turn them inside yes. out and once a, <laughs> yeah. I have them wrapped. Um, I have them wrapped under the Christmas tree right now oh, for my kids. Oh, nice, nice. That was 
the number one thing on my daughter's list. She wrote a billion reversible octopuses. Is what she wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I I love I love the artistic sense of humor. Like uh, I get stuff like my my mom's friends. Uh, you know, we're, I'm quite close with my mom's friends, and she has a daughter who's who's artistic, and she comes out with the most beautiful statements because she's so hyperlexic. She has mm-hmm. all these this vocabulary to use. And she just presents it in a way that just like, <laughs> it's so adult, <laughs> but she just says it as a, as a kid. So it's like, and she doesn't yeah. really comprehend it. And it's like, <laughs> That's great. It's brilliant. It, it was really like, my, reminds me, my daughter will tell me about, so my daughter's nine, my son's six. And she'll talk about her younger brother. He's antagonizing me. <laughs> <laughs> No, he's being mean. Like it's just he's that antagonization. <laughs> yes, indeed. Mom, he's gaslighting me. <laughs> That's next. <laughs> he has no cog- cognitive empathy for me right now. <laughs> I mean, there's there's the stuff that we could that I could touch on quickly. So I made like a sort of a single post over on my Instagram. Thomas Henley UK, if anyone wants to follow. And um, I went through some of like the common barriers that that have come up for me and through talking to other autistic people. Mm-hmm. It was the, the direct versus indirect. I think that's a really big thing. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's the whole thing of, you know, the neurotypical, they interpret it wrong and they're like, you know, you, what you said, you know, how you said that, it didn't really sit well with me, and and we're like, my words mean my words. They're like the the same. Yeah. There's also those touch needs, as as you were saying. Like, I think for people who don't really understand autism and sensory stuff, like you saying to your partner that your partner's coming over to cuddle, and you're like, no, 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 I don't want to cuddle now. And mm-hmm. uh, some people take that really badly. So people yeah. are okay with it. Um, I think that is definitely another one. There's also alexithymia. Mm-hmm. Like, as we were talking about earlier, like, how are you supposed to, if your partner asks, well, how do you feel about it? Like, how well, how are you feeling in our relationship? Or how do you feel? And it's like, oh, my God, like, I'm going to have to spend, like, a week trying to figure <laughs> out how I feel about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just having having the space, I think, is really important. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the cognitive empathy, you know, neurotypicals getting frustrated at us because we can't understand how they're feeling without them telling us. Mm-hmm. The hyperfocus, I think, is yes. could be another one. Mm-hmm. You know, someone may try to start a conversation with you when you're engaged with your special interest or when you're no. working. No, <laughs> that's it's so like, hard. It's not, it's not going to happen. No, no, it's, no. It's like, can we not do this now? Um, <laughs> that's yeah, another definitely. thing that people find out that kind of inertia is hard for people to understand yeah and also the processing especially during arguments processing Mm -hmm. time massive massive that's one thing i was going to mention is the delayed processing for Mm -hmm. sure that makes it difficult because i can um we were also again saying in community groups like a lot of times the the answer that you give is not the real answer so like if somebody asks you a question you give an answer it's not necessarily how you let's say the question is, how are you feeling? You give an answer. It's not necessarily the real answer because the delayed processing of it, it's like, like you said, it's going to take time, like days, a Mm. week later, you'll be able to understanding from hindsight, start understanding, start internalizing what actually, what the impact of that conversation was, how it affected you. Like it just takes a lot of time and it can be really uncomfortable for the other person when you like come back to a conversation a week later and you're like, Hey, this is how I really feel about <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> and yes, they're like, why exactly. didn't you say that? And they're like, yeah. how are you hitting me with this now with no warning? It's like, yeah, yeah you asked me to think about it and I thought about it and here I am. And a week later, yeah. <laughs> so I was trying to yeah. explain it to you. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really, really critical because I, I I've, it's not currently out, but I'm sort of making a series that's kind of talking about autism in relation to 
like uh, manipulation or emotionally abusive tactics. Like there's a particular one which I have experience with and it's absolutely awful. It's called uh, word salads. Yes. Have you heard of word salads? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Someone rattles off contin- like continuous points unrelated to each other mm-hmm. with the intention of just discombobulating you. Yeah, making you confused and forgetting what your point was in the first place. Exactly. And, and what we really need in an important conversation, especially when it's about the relationship, is even even less speed than usual and just time yes. to think and time to like process and talk to it talk to each other about it but obviously it's not always like that and Mm -hmm. you know some people may get frustrated and say like well we need to talk about it now it's important I want to talk about it I'm feeling this way it's like Mm -hmm. it's probably not the best time to be talking if you're feeling like you can't sort of rein things in and just have a have a conversation yeah I don't I I think there's there's stuff around that that's that's definitely pressing processing time Mm-hmm. Um, especially with with people who are, are perhaps not the best for you, can right. really sort of mess you up because you you feel like you yeah. don't have anything to say that you're stupid and you're like, yeah, you're not. You just don't have the time to explain things and answer questions. Right, and when you're dealing with the word salad and other manipulative tactics, it just it's like somebody spins you around in a chair, and it's like, well, wait, exactly. You know, I I had a point, and it was important for our relationship, but now, you know, that it, it just kind of exponentially increases your processing time. I think is what what you said. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You're always trying to like catch up with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, shut shutdowns, meltdowns, obviously, can be another whole different ball of eggs, but I. Eat. Bowl of eggs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a whole different bowl of eggs. The and, other day, um, I was uh, shooting a video, and I said, "I was." I meant to say "can of worms," and I said "bag of worms," and I didn't catch it <laughs> until I was editing. I was like, "What? <laughs> bag of worms?" Oh man! Yeah, yeah. Um, my brain does that sometimes. I, I take <laughs> well-known phrases and I just change one word in it, and it just completely doesn't land. I'm just like, yeah. God. <laughs> But yeah, the sh- the shutdowns obviously, I think are probably more problematic in a lot of senses because if you have the selective selective mutism, um, that can really be hard for for people, especially if you're having an argument. Yeah, and then they push you further, and then you have a meltdown. Um, it can it can really just get in the way of like productive conversation about like things that really need to be talked about within relationships. Yeah. yeah. At the risk of sort of pushing pushing things onwards. I mean, I know we're, talk- we're sort of the the overarching topic of the podcast is talking about autism in women, 